resilient cities. Uh, and our speaker is Henry Gordon Smith, founder and CEO of Agritecture. Welcome, Henry. Hi, how's it going? Great. The show is all yours. Great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed all the talks today and this deep dive into sustainability and buildings. So uh, today I'm going to sort of talk about a different angle, which is urban ag tech and something that we work on uh, at Agritecture. So uh, if you want to contact me, by the way, my Twitter, my contact information is here if you want to. First, a little bit about me. I'm extremely passionate about cities. Um, I was born in Hong Kong and grew up in Hong Kong till I was six and then Tokyo till I was 10 moved to Europe, lived in various European cities, and graduated high school in Moscow, Russia. So some of the biggest cities on earth. And so I definitely didn't grow up with a green thumb, but I was always fascinated about architecture and cities and design. So what I do now is I speak at a lot of events around the world about ag tech and trying to help people understand it and its role in how we adapt to climate change. And for me, it really is about not only mitigation, but adaptation. The climate is changing, it's affecting our food systems and we need to respond. Um, I also started as a blogger and so I traveled the world visiting lots of farms before I started my consulting practice. And I started a blog in 2011 called Agritecture, which reported on the emergence of this new idea of saying what happens when we bring food into the city. And so Agritecture is really about what that merging looks like and how to do it effectively. Um, I've been able to build an amazing team and we've consulted around the world, I think 130 projects to date in uh, over 30 countries. So it's been very global, very diverse. And I've got an amazing team based in Europe, the Middle East and the US. And also I really like to do a lot of leadership and advising. And so I advise multiple companies, everything from Food Shed, which uses blockchain to connect farmers and uh, buyers to vertical farming companies, to even nonprofits like Teens for Justice that builds high-tech farms in schools to combat food insecurity. So there's a little bit more about me, but let's get into what the challenge really is ahead of us. What is really the issue? And uh, I've broken down some of the key issues that urban ag tech uh, can be a solution to. So one of the key issues is popula population growth. Um, you, know, you may already know this, but about 80% of our food will be consumed in cities uh, by around 2030, they estimate. And so just think about that. 80% of our global food supply is going directly to cities as more of us live in cities. But can you imagine and think about how many cities actually have plans to protect their food system, right? Cities have historically not been about food in recent history, more long-term history they were. But in recent history, they haven't. They've sort of pushed agriculture out of the city and say, you know what, we want residential spaces. We want commercial spaces. We want to have you know, things that are really cool and urban. We don't want farming. That's like dirty and poor. And so we've moved it away and centralized it somewhere else and increased, it, increased the risk that the city has to shocks in the system that can come from climate change. Was there a question? OK, sorry, I saw somebody off mute. Um, there's also a rising demand from consumers for the products grown in farms that are smaller and more local. So we're actually seeing that the demand for local food is actually competing with organic and it's increasing in demand rapidly. So that demand is obviously forcing a lot of interest into how technology can allow us to grow more food close to cities and closer to consumers. We also have other issues in the city, including inequality that are starting to sort of show how food um, can bring us together, but also how it can separate us. We find that in most major cities, marginalized communities, people of color live in what are called food deserts. And these are areas where they have to walk more than a mile to get fresh food. So as the pressure of these urban environments get more intense and the pressure from climate change, we're also seeing other aspects of the food system unravel in the urban environment. Another reason to bring more food into the city to more equality and justice. I've mentioned a couple of times, but when we think about climate change and the global food system, think about all these different crops, coffee, wheat, soy, leafy greens, they need particular climate conditions um, and the abundant free sunlight, but also the right temperature, the right water conditions to produce consistently and provide that abundant affordable food that we've been living off of really over the past century, that's really helped feed more people. Now those systems are at threat. So we're seeing ecosystem collapse 
and we're seeing particular climates no longer able to produce the food we need to survive. That means we have to put more inputs in, which is actually in many cases exacerbating the problem. Going back to cities again, we crave nature. We actually have a lot of evidence that nature helps us um, heal mentally and physically. And we actually have removed a lot of it from cities. So while parks can help, urban agriculture and bringing food production to the city can help in a different way, a unique way. And ag tech, the technology use of this can actually help us do it in a way that's really attractive to younger generations, uses less space and allows things to grow year round even if the climate doesn't allow it. We also have a, a really big issue of the fact that farmers are aging. You know, I didn't grow up with my parents saying, you know what, Henry, you should be a farmer, right? My parents said, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be a technologist, go into finance. And so as a result of that, we have really this, this crisis, especially in the developed world, in the US, Europe, and, um, and Australia, the average age of the farmer is far over 50, around 60, 56 years old on average. So that means that those farmers are not passing that knowledge on, and we're actually losing the knowledge we need to maintain our current food supply. So what is urban ag tech and how can it be part of the solution? Let's dive into that a little bit. First, I'll start with a question here. Here are three different urban farms. All of them are real, all of them exist. So the first one is in Montreal. It's a rooftop hydroponic greenhouse, meaning it uses water and no soil. So it can be integrated into the rooftop very easily. It produces year round. It's a greenhouse. In Paris, this is Sous the Fraise. This is a rooftop soil-based farming system, but it does use verticality, but it's exposed to the elements and it produces a wide variety of crops on those rooftops. And then in Kyoto, we have Spread Company, which has a robot automated vertical farm, which is basically hydroponics indoors, stacked on multiple levels, completely controlled environment. So which of these farms is the best? Any ideas? Think about it. What might be the, the best way? Well, agritecture doesn't believe that there is any best way. We don't believe there's one size fits all. And so like architects, we approach the problem from an open mind and we use design thinking. We say, these are all tools in the toolbox and the problem at hand requires matching the right solution with it. So if the problem is inequality, that's gonna require a different kind of farm than if the problem is a lack of supply due to COVID-19 or due to climate change issues. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. But the main point here is to start thinking analytically about urban ag tech as something you can integrate into the built environment as part of smart cities, as part of sustainable cities, as part of resilient cities. So another way to look at it is a spectrum from low tech to high tech. So on the low tech side, we may have something you're more familiar with. These are community gardens. These are places you can walk up and learn, maybe even pick some of your own um, you know, greens. We also have rooftop farms. These are typically soil-based as well. And they, were, they have a little bit more tech, a little bit more engineering, but they're still exposed to the environment. So typically like this one in New York, they can't grow year round because the winter gets cold. And then we have some hybrid models where they combine an indoor greenhouse. So for year round production and soil, so they get the best of both worlds. Sky Vegetables is a rooftop hydroponic greenhouse, so about a thousand square meters, 10,000 square feet on top of a lead platinum affordable housing building. So that's really cool. It's, it's actually part of the new building itself and a new paradigm for sustainable buildings. And then we have Aero Farms, which is an example of high-tech vertical farming, producing millions of pounds year round in a warehouse using no pesticides. And so when we talk about urban ag tech, we typically tend to talk about these three here, ones that use you know, data, software, robotics, technologies to automate the solutions. And that does happen a little bit on the soil side, but urban ag tech uh, tends to refer to sort of greenhouses and vertical farms. Let's dive a little bit deeper into this analytical lens, right? So you can see here, I've got the same layout of technologies on top. And then on the left, I have the benefits, social, economic, environmental, aesthetic. Aesthetic is like, is it beautiful? Does it inspire us? Health, does it keep us active? Educational is a pretty obvious one. And so you can do your own analysis, but if we look across the spectrum, there's different typical impacts for them. And soil tends to have the most aesthetic impact, the most environmental impact for reasons I'll show you in a moment. But on the commercial ag tech side, that's where you get the most economic benefit, job creation. And in some cases, because you can produce so much more in those farms, the high tech 
greenhouses and vertical farms, they have great environmental benefits because you're sort of offsetting food miles from imported product. And so food miles, just a moment on that, 95% of the leafy greens that you would buy in New York City or Boston come from California or Arizona. And they're grown outdoors and they're shipped across the country. They, they're stored in facilities, then stored in the store, and then stored in your fridge until you finally eat it. That system is flawed. And vertical farms and greenhouses are trying to say, hey, we can actually grow all of this locally. And that's why there's a lot of them being developed on the eastern seaboard of the United States. So this is about thinking analytically about what is the right match, thinking about an architect and seeing these technologies as tools in your toolbox. If we dive deeper into the environmental ag, uh, impact lens, we can also start to look at each of these and how they differ. So rooftop greenhouses can provide insulation in the winter. Rooftop soil-based farms can provide stormwater management and slow it down. So in a place like New York City, where you have a lot of stormwater issues, Rooftop soil-based farms get a lot of incentives from the city for green infrastructure. You can also do that on the ground to manage rainwater, or you can do it on the ground to manage biodiversity or rather increase biodiversity, reduce heat island effect. So if we look in Paris, Paris had a lot of um, heat waves and actually a number of Parisians and people across France actually died in a couple of different summers of heat. Urban farms and rooftop green roofs and green farms maintain a cooler temperature that can help the building perform better, can help the city co stay cooler overall. You don't get that same benefit with greenhouses or vertical farms. That's something that's mostly exclusive to vegetation and um, some of the more simpler low-tech solutions. Organic waste management can happen in soil-based systems as well, but vertical farms are fantastic because they use 90% or more less water. So if you're in a water-scarce environment like Dubai, it's an incredible solution that makes sense. If you're in a city like New York where there's very little space, vertical farms can be in basements, like our client Farm One that's in a basement in Tribeca. And you get the idea. I want you to think analytically about the differences in these benefits. When we think about ag tech, it really relates to vertical farms and greenhouses, as I men mentioned, and these are the technologies that are happening. So when you build these high-tech farms, this is one called InFarm based out of Germany, you are capturing millions of data points typically, and you're using that data and AI and machine learning to optimize. The ultimate vision here is that you minimize the need for humans to be involved, which improves the quality of the product from a food safety perspective. Less people that touch it, the more food safe it is. And also you improve the bottom line and start to make farming and agriculture, which is typically a business that has three to 16% profit margins, have profit margins between 30 to 50%. So we're starting to now create viable businesses around agricultural again, as we, as we prepare for the next century of extreme climate change and, cha and challenges related to that. So let's just show you some case studies of real farms and uh, maybe get you thinking about it a bit more. So this is the sky vegetables I mentioned, it's about 10,000 square feet. I put 8,000 there, but it's probably 8,000 of cultivation space. This is where I first learned hydroponics as an intern. It's in the Bronx, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States and a food desert. And what's really cool about this, if you Google it, you can see it's a lead platinum building about eight stories high with a greenhouse on top and it was part of the planning stages. And I think that's a really exciting new paradigm that we can design buildings that grow food from the beginning, which is obviously the best way to optimize the greenhouse itself and its relationship to the building. This greenhouse captures rainwater, recycles it in the basement using UV filters, pumps it back up, grows the food. This building also serves as insulation to the building. And you see sort of these little metal things below the channels of plants. Those are actually fin tubes that use waste heat from the building to warm the plants to reduce the need for heating in the winter, which is pretty cool. Um, Aero Farms is a much larger facility just outside of New York and New Jersey. And again, this is about maximizing the yield in a small space. So they've really been super innovative in building very tall vertical farming systems and using a method of of hydroponics called aeroponics, which is even more water efficient. So all of these greens in this farm are grown without spraying any pesticides and they're delivered to the customers in 24 hours or less. That's the vision for this. And vertical farming is on fire right now. We have seen over $2.5 billion invested into the sector overall. I've been in the sector for 10 years and $1 billion of that has been in the past year. So if you look at the announcements, there's a lot of SPACs, a lot of companies going public. 
the sector is heating up. Why? Because investors know that our supply chain is at threat and they know that we need some new ways to grow food. And we know that cities are the future of that. And these are what farms and cities can look like at a high tech level. This is another interesting project that we're consulting on called um, Aqua Arc, and it's a, it's a floating greenhouse. So think about cities, there's not a lot of space. Well, let's go onto the water. And so there's one in the Netherlands called the floating farm that actually has cows. This one is just gonna be a greenhouse for, uh, for vegetables and some fruits, but it would be the largest greenhouse in New York City and maybe any major city um, to date. And so we're building a sort of floating raft there for our client or we're consulting them on it and then building a large greenhouse on that that can be automated. And actually right here, just north of this, this is the Bronx, is Hunts Point. And Hunts Point is the world's largest food distribution hub. When Hurricane Sandy came to New York City, it just missed Hunts Point. If it had hit Hunts Point, that would have been a, a huge disaster. New York City has two days, two days of food if all of the supply stops coming. So if there was a threat to those supplies or they stopped, there'd be two days of food supply for the city. Imagine that, it's a pretty scary thought. This is how these farms can contribute to that resilience. We already know post COVID that certain cities, including cities in Thailand, uh, cities in Brazil and even Orlando, Florida that had urban agriculture plans were able to activate and use those to help feed the needy during this very difficult time of COVID that affected the food system significantly. This is that one in a basement in Tribeca I mentioned, Farm One, a project that we're very, very proud to have consulted on their first facility because it's not just leafy greens. This is like the ultimate high-tech chef garden. It serves Michelin star restaurants and it serves, serves high-end customers. So it's not really about feeding the world, but it is about creating a new relationship with food where the chefs can essentially ask what they want. They could even say, you know, I want it to be bigger. I want the leaves bigger. I want you to grow it longer. The flavor wasn't quite what I needed. And it's a really amazing brand and company. I invite you to look them up at farm.one and just see what they're doing. But this is in a basement, one of the most expensive places on earth. There's a farm that's profitable and is growing. I love it. Brooklyn Grange, you know, although it's not on the sort of high tech side, I wanted to mention it because it's a really incredible example of rooftop farms and it's very successful. They actually have multiple locations across New York City. And there are ways you can sort of see here, there's some technology here that automates irrigation. So even though it's soil, it can be a little bit high tech. There's data points that these farms can produce. There's certain levels of automation that can happen. There's even technologies they're using to optimize the soil, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways that tech can be involved across that spectrum I mentioned already. What cities need to do to be successful in this sector, I've sort of broken it down to, I think, six main steps. Number one is to really identify the gaps, like what is the problem you're trying to solve? Two is like defining those and the specific impact you want to have, you know, KPIs and ROIs related to that. The third one is to commit. A big problem is that there's a lack of leadership. The city of Philadelphia, the city of DC, Atlanta, they have directors of urban agriculture, but no other US city does. Um, Dubai now has a minister of food security. That's a step in the right direction. Singapore is taking a lead. Paris is taking a lead, but most cities don't have that. So, you know, three is about making a public commitment. We wanna grow X amount of food or have X amount of farms or be, be this resilient, et cetera. And that's one of the main problems that cities don't have budgets for agriculture and they haven't connected agriculture to smart cities and resilient cities yet. They need to create pathways for entrepreneurs. I mentioned the investment. There's so much excitement in the sector right now, and there's really not as many pathways as there need to be for entrepreneurs to develop these farms. For example, most cities don't have zoning for agriculture. That needs to change. Farming was part of cities, and now it's back. So we need to really create space for them in cities. Five is about fostering and engaging communities, diversity and race. These are really important things not to forget in any plan. So you need to make sure it's equitable. And six is having specific tools to track and optimize as you go through your journey of making your city more resilient through urban ag tech. So back to agritecture, who we are, just very briefly, our mission is to accelerate this whole sector. We do that through blogging, which is where, where, where I started as a college student blogging about this sector. Then in 2014, we started consulting. We have the, the most active consulting firm globally for this sector. And in a moment, I'll tell you about our new software that we've just launched. So here's a sample of our projects around the world. 
We, we love the variety. I mentioned it a couple of times. We think um, our database of farms, which we think is the largest database of urban farms in the world, and the fact that there's a variety of climates and scales is very important to our success. These are some of the services we provide, but I want to skip over and just show you the software in a moment. So we just launched a software called Agriculture Designer, and this is really intended to help anyone that wants to understand this sector from a data perspective. Instead of having to go to a consultant, you can actually just go online and you can input information. Maybe it's the rooftop of your building. Maybe it's a business idea you have. But right now on our software, you can estimate the CapEx, yield, number of jobs, return on investment for any greenhouse or vertical farm in the world. And this is one way we're disrupting a whole sector to achieve our mission of again, helping us adapt to climate change. We've got online classes on the software that you can take at your convenience. And then we also have this part that I mentioned that shows you the CapEx and OpEx and all these economic details. This is information that you know is Im impossible really to find unless you hire a consultant. So really trying to make it more affordable and accessible through digitization and through our digital transformation as a company. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, you can email me or contact me later. Thank you so much, Henry.